share with you a verse from um, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 it says praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead isn't it amazing to know that we have a living hope that we depend on every day every day of our lives so we just sing praises to God and we just honor him today. We honor him for, for everything that he has done on the cross, for the blood shed on the Calvary. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise you in this place, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. How great the chasm that lay between.
John chapter 6, Jesus addresses the crowd that was following him. From verse 32, it says, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you. You know, it's something important when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you. It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And further along in the same passage, again he says, Truly, truly I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So he's speaking to the crowd. This is after he has fed the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish. And so they're following him and they're all looking for him. And he knows that they're looking to him to, to meet their physical needs. And then Jesus responds with this powerful and profound truth. I am 
the bread of life. We see the word bread used in the Bible quite often, hundreds of times. It's, um, it's an essential element of, of a meal in Jesus' day. The Hebrew term to eat bread is, means the same thing as to have a meal. And the word bread is often used as a general word for food. And throughout the Bible, bread is a representation of God's provision to his people. The manna, the manna in the desert that Jesus refers to in this passage was God's provision for his people. And then going back to Genesis 3, verse 19, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. References there to bread that you eat, that sustains you temporarily, but will not keep you from dying, will not keep you from death. Bread that you work for with your hands, but it doesn't keep you from the grave. But then something different. Out of Bethlehem came Jesus. The Father sent Jesus to us. And it's interesting that the word Bethlehem means house of bread. Out of Bethlehem, Jesus came to us. The true bread from heaven. The bread of life. And the bread that Jesus speaks of here, the bread of life, it's different. Jesus is our bread. He's our food. He's our sustenance. Only Jesus is the living bread that gives eternal life. Not Moses, not the manna, not through our own efforts, which won't last. Jesus promised that all who freely accept this bread, Jesus Christ, will no longer hunger, will find full satisfaction in and through Christ alone. Now, this token of bread that you all have, that you all have in your hands right now, it speaks of him who through the sacrifice of his flesh and the shedding of his blood gives us life, eternal life. This crisp bread won't sustain your body for very long physically but Jesus Christ whom this token represents will sustain you for all time eternal life over death, sustenance for our spiritual hunger and thirst so that we never hunger again the true bread, the only true bread that can eternally sustain us Nothing else sustains us. We might seek other things in this life, like looking for the manna in the desert, but they don't satisfy for long. Only Jesus is the bread that feeds us and sustains us and keeps us and completes us for always. So this communion this morning, this communion that you hold in your hands, let us reflect on it as we sit there quietly Reflect on how we have sought to feed our spiritual hunger. With what have we tried to fill the hunger in our spirit? Have we satisfied ourselves with the bread of life? Or have we been looking for other forms of sustenance? It's a bit like consuming junk food, you know. You, you know the things that you've propped yourself up with that last for a little while, but don't last for eternity. Maybe you've allowed other things to get in the way of your relationship with him, like a job, friends, or problems that you've focused on instead of keeping your eyes on your Lord. Or maybe you've been seeking the Lord for temporal things that serve no eternal purpose rather than seeking the giver of life. 
So let's right now, in these next few moments, as you remain seated quietly, reflect on these things. Offer them to God. Ask for forgiveness if you need to. And then in your own time, partake, eat and drink the bread and the wine, his flesh and blood that he gave for our eternal life, reminding ourselves he, Jesus, is the bread of life. Let's do that now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for providing for us, for sending your Son, Jesus, for providing for us our daily bread, for providing for us in Jesus Christ everything essential for our well-being. You have done. You have provided. Help us, help us to recognise our hunger for you, to feast upon you, to feast upon your word, the living word, the living bread. Thank you for the grace and the mercy and the love that you have shown in sending Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tess, and again, I am so humbled to be here today and to be sharing some thoughts in a longer period of time. <laughs> so thank you. Today, I'd like to share with you about how we can find hope in difficult situations, how we can find treasures in darkness, and wealth stored in secret places. But before we dive in, let's commit these coming moments to the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, you said in um, Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. We call on your name, Lord, and commit this coming concentrated period of time. We pray for your wisdom as you show us great and mighty things which we have yet to discover. Give us eyes to see ears to hear, and a heart to understand the wonderful things that you have to say to us today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever walked through a season so difficult you feared your faith might crumble? For the last several years, especially recently, we've witnessed suffering and pain in a global scale with everything that is happening around us, especially with a pandemic which has superseded other worldwide events. We have seen sufferings in all levels, physical, relational, emotional, psychological, financial, economical sufferings, to name a few, as well as the threat of the disease and even death. All of us here have been affected one way or the other. Overall, 2020, 2021, and 2022 have been extremely painful and emotional times for everyone. Apart from this pandemic, we also deal with other major issues, cancer ravages families. A diagnosis of a debilitating disease can devastate loved ones. Divorce shatters everyone involved. Pain pulls us down. I remember the time several years ago, just within a week of having buried our dear dad in the Philippines and having just come back to Adelaide, I received a phone call from Manila. It was my older sister calling. That phone call resulted in my heart racing. 
A dark cloud settled over me in the coming hours. I received news that our mom had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Remember that we had just buried our dad within a week prior to receiving this news. It went from day to night in an instant of hearing about mom's diagnosis and the prognosis. Within a year and a half, the darkness thickened. I was heavily pregnant when I had to travel back to Manila with my two children, older children in tow, to be with my beautiful mom in her last few hours of her earthly life. Pain, confusion, tears, worry, and life itself set in like never before as I walked into the darkness. I had endless wrestling matches with God, pleading with Him to let the pain disappear. I did not know how to process everything that was happening to me back then. I was pregnant and had just lost both parents in a span of one and a half years. Often we ask God, where are you? I cannot find you. I am in desperate need of you. I am in such darkness at this very moment. Maybe a lot of us here are going through rough patches in life. This may be with regard to health, depression, anxieties brought about by this pandemic, grief, unresolved issues that we have been harboring, addiction, financial difficulty, children that have become wayward, identity crisis, miscarriages, barrenness, aging, constant pain. Maybe you too have experienced the blow of surprising or devastating diagnosis. Perhaps you've lost a loved one and your grieving heart cannot make sense of the sorrow. Maybe this past year of social isolation, fear and turmoil have taken their toll. Where is God in all this darkness? Today, I would like to encourage us all as we learn that there are treasures to be discovered in darkness. There are riches in darkness. We can find hope in the unexpected places of darkness. These places of darkness are those painful places of suffering where we would very much like not to be. But we have to take heart as we walk into the darkness that God has something there for us that is unique and precious for us that can only be discovered in darkness. Our main text for today is in Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 3. But before reading the text, let me give you a backgrounder of the story. Isaiah predicted 200 years in advance about how a famous king of Persia would invade Babylon and then liberate the Jews from the Babylonian captivity and then bring them back to their homeland in Israel. He prophesied that this Persian king would be named Cyrus. And this unfolded exactly as Isaiah had predicted several centuries after. One day, as the prophet Daniel, was, who was a student of God's word and who was among the Jewish exiles who lived during the Babylonian captivity, was studying the scroll of Isaiah, he discovered about Isaiah's prophecy and he also realized that Israel's captivity under the Babylonian rule were completed. So Daniel then took the scroll to the then reigning Persian king, King Cyrus, to show him that his name, Cyrus's name, had been recorded in scripture about two centuries earlier on. As Daniel unveiled the prophecy, it shocked Cyrus to the core of his being, but this gave him confidence in liberating the Jews from their exile and return the Jews to the land of Israel and announce the rebuilding of Solomon's temple. What an incredible story. But there's something more to that. God would not let Cyrus liberate Israel without reward. Let's now read the prophecy of Isaiah in our main text. Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 3. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double door so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you 
and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. It's amazing how this transpired because it literally came to pass. The Lord was saying to Cyrus, Cyrus, when you free Israel and accomplish my purpose, I will give you the treasures of darkness and wealth stored in secret places. On the exact day, Cyrus issued the decree freeing the Jews and granting them permission to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. His soldiers back in Babylon unearthed vast amounts of silver and gold, which the king of Babylon had hidden under the Euphrates River. Incredible riches came out of heartbreaking captivity, just like God promised. God's word through Isaiah had been fulfilled to the letter when he said in Isaiah 45, verse 3, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. And like Cyrus, who found treasures hidden in the darkness, we too can find treasures in darkness. There are many things we can discover as we unearth these treasures. We can discover that he knows us and calls us by our name. The Lord said to Cyrus in Isaiah 45, verse 3, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. This great God, the God of Israel, the awesome God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is the one who summons us by our name. And there's nothing more personal to us than our names. He knows us intimately. Our God knows us intimately. And he calls us by our name. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, Now we see but a poor reflection, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. We are fully known to God. There's nothing more intimate than being fully known by our God. He knows everything in us, all our uniqueness, our weirdness, our weaknesses, what makes us laugh, and what makes us cry. God knows our fears, our hopes, our dreams. He knows every molecule and fiber of our being. No one fully knows us on earth, but only God. He knows us. He knows even our rising up and our going down. He is the only one who can go into the depths of who we are through the layers and layers of our personality to the core of our being. And this is the God who calls us by our name. What a treasure. We can also discover as we unearth these treasures that we need to act in faith to get these treasures. Like Cyrus, God wants us to claim his blessings by acting in faith. Faith is not its right believing, and it is our currency to transact business with God. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 6. No one will receive the treasures of darkness or hidden riches of secret places without acting in faith. We have to move toward the plan that God has ordained in our life. Faith is not a passive word. Faith is an action word. It is not something we just believe. It is something we do. Faith always requires action, and it is through faith that we can access those treasures hidden in darkness. As we unearth these treasures, we can also discover that everything God does has a purpose. There's no accident in God, and nothing God does is without a purpose. His purpose for rewarding Cyrus was to reveal himself as the true and living God. The Lord wanted this Persian king convinced that he is God Almighty. He proved this by calling Cyrus by name two centuries before his birth, and then predicting that Cyrus will collect the treasures of darkness. Colossians 1 
Verse 16 says, For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything got started in him and find its purpose in him. As we unearth these treasures, we can also discover that our eyes have to be open to the things that would otherwise remain unseen. When God says he will give us the treasures of darkness and wealth stored in hidden places, it means God wants us to open our eyes to the things that would otherwise remain unseen so we can claim what would otherwise remain unclaimed. Ephesians 1, 18, verse 19 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people and his comparably great power for us who believe. Another treasure we can discover is that treasures are stored in darkness. We may ask ourselves, where can I find these treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places? Think about the answer. The treasures of darkness are stored in darkness of all places. And the wealth of secret places are hidden in secret places of all locations. This means that these treasures surround us as we live in this broken world. And you know what is even better? God is not hiding these treasures from us. He is hiding these treasures for us. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. As we unearth these treasures, we can also discover that God understands what we are going through and he will surely come to our aid. This applies to every hurting person, every broken person just like you and me, regardless of who we are, irrespective of how bleak or unrighteous our past was, because he knows that life is difficult for everyone at times that pain is a regular companion for many, that Christians are not exempt from affliction, and that we would constantly need his help to survive our ordeals in life. Like the Israelites, we long for safety, for security, for satisfaction, and we long for abundance. But instead, we endure unfair and unnecessary hardships most of which are beyond our control. We live with stress, with sorrow, with uncertainty, because we live in a damaged world. However, we see evidence of his power and grace everywhere. And we can believe that God will come through for us. God responds to our faith in him by helping us endure our afflictions and by producing goodness from them. We are not only assured that God will come to our aid, but God will surely come to our aid. We have the promise in Psalm 46, 1, which says, He is our very present help in times of need. As we unearth these treasures, we can also discover that God has invaded and has complete control of darkness. There are so many other verses that talk about darkness. How we who dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. How Jesus prayed in the dark repeatedly. How the darkness has not overcome the light. Light dispels darkness. So wherever and whenever there is darkness, let us allow the entrance of light. Isaiah 60 verse 2 even says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness for the, for the people but the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. God is huge and powerful and he can intervene in our darkness in ways only an all-powerful God can do. You can probably talk about amazing stories of how God has intervened through tough times just when you thought there was no hope or restoration or salvation. Another 
thing we can discover as we unearth these treasures is that it is okay if others do not understand what we are going through. This was another treasure I discovered during the first couple of days of mom passing on. It is okay if others do not understand what I was going through, what we were going through as siblings. Exodus 20 verse 21 talks about darkness when it said this, and the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. It is okay if others stand afar off. It is okay to walk as a family alone. Our darkness is not to be understood by everyone, so it is perfectly fine. I watched as others were there for my family, yet worlds apart. A bond began to form within our family, amongst my siblings. The pressure of the darkness brought us together. Forming a unified family fellowship we could not have received any other way, which has continued on to this day. He revealed himself as he moved into our darkness and changed everything. Isn't it such a joy to know of God's hand of grace at work in the midnight hour in the lives of his people? Another thing we can unearth, another thing we can discover as we unearth these treasures is that we can worship him in the darkness. Drawing from my personal walk, when I wake up each morning and step out of bed, I flex my neck, my back, my wrists, my ankles, my knees, and I try moving them to test them. My question each day is, would I be able to move comfortably today? Where else would I have pain, and how bad would it be? No, I'm not injured. I have been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Medically speaking, it's treatable, but not curable. And I have pain every day, sometimes mild and manageable, sometimes severe and unmanageable. But where do I turn when it seems that life is a pain, however that pain manifests? As a Christian, the easy answer is to turn to God. But how do I do that when the very circumstances I am in seem to contradict what I've heard about God? But from this message about riches in darkness, it gives me more hope that I need to not only endure trials, but to know that I can worship God and glorify Him through this condition. He knows me by name and notices every detail of my life. He is in control and He has a plan for me and for you. The God who calls us by name has hidden riches in our suffering and pain. He can intervene in our darkness and He will be close to us in that darkness. This should lead us to praise Him what we know about God leads us to worship him. When Job lost everything that mattered to him, he worshiped because of what he knew to be true of God. Job 1, 20, 21 relates to us that Job stood up, tore his robe in grief, and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother, and naked I will return. The Lord has given, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Even as Job lost everything, what he knew about God caused him to fall on his knees and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I understand you've given and you've taken away, and I praise your name. As we unearth these treasures, we can also discover that God is our treasure in darkness. He is the, our treasure in darkness. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. God is not playing hide and seek with us. His intention is that as we seek Him, we may not only find His hand of provision, but we may find Him, our great provider. Paul's longing in Philippians 3.10 was that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He is our treasure in darkness. God is always with us in the darkness that we go through in life. Remember what he said, 
I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you to the uttermost part of the earth. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. He was the treasure I discovered as my siblings and I walked into the darkness of uncertainty. God was already there, and he was with us all along. When it comes to dark times, we come to realize that our greatest treasure is God. Then all the other treasures follow. There is no treasure in darkness without God. It is necessary that God be first in all things, including the first to be discovered in darkness. God, already being in the darkness we were facing, made facing the darkness possible for us. Without his presence, I would have collapsed under the pressure of the blackness. Thank God he is there all along in our darkness before we even get into it. Can I please ask the musos to come back up? Thank you. Are you experiencing a time of darkness in your life? The challenge for us today is to believe God. The treasures actually exist in darkness. In the difficult times of our lives, in challenging situations, that these treasures can be found and that they are accessible for us. These treasures are worth seeking, and they are treasures from God that can only be found in those places of our deepest pain and the deepest, deepest hurt that we have. Think about your experience and ask God to reveal his riches to you in the midst of the darkness. Let's pray to God to help us understand the darkness, our need for him to be with us, and our need for him to lift us out. Acts 17, 27 declares, so we could see after God and not just grope around in the dark, but actually find him. He doesn't play hide and seek with us. He is not remote. He is near. This week, let's reflect with our small group, our close friends, how these moments help, the, help us understand how God helps us through our time of darkness. What we know leads us to worship him. Job, after he went through all the difficult times in his life, found riches in darkness. Job 42, 5 declares, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Friends in Christ, there are riches in darkness.
Thanks for joining us today. Feel free to check out our website at lakechristiancenter.com.au or our church app to find out more information about us, learn how to give online, and all our upcoming events.